Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Welcome. Uh, my name is Nikolai Stange. I'm uh, working in the SUSE Labs core team, and today I'll talk about the adventures of implementing a trusted platform module in Rust. Um, so let's start with a really quick overview of uh, what a trusted platform module is. You probably all heard it in some form or the other in the context of full disk encryption or so. So it's a trusted platform module. It's standardized by the Trusted Computing Group. Um, there's several possible implementation on the one end of the spectrum. There's like a real tamper-resistant hardware chip, and on the other end, there's just like a, a yeah, software emulation in user space. Um, the functionality is basically can act as a cryptographic processor and with the important feature that the keying material, material would never leave the chip. Um, then, which is also important, for example, for remote attestation, is that it can uh, attest a complete history of uh, integrity measurement. Yeah, needless to say, it's a uh, very important building block for uh, confidential computing in general. Um, so now some bit of a context how I came to it. So there's the um, Coconut SVSM project started and mostly or <laughs> completely implemented by Jörg. Um, in brief, that's um, in guest device emulation layer. So you have your encrypted uh, VM running under uh, currently AMD, SAV, SMP, and between the guest kernel and the hypervisor, there's that uh, SVSM. Uh, one nice feature about um, AMD, SAV, SMP is that it introduced that concept of uh, privilege levels within the VM, which is quite similar to the uh, rings you know from the x86 architecture, but kind of, I mean, it's only similar. It's, it's uh, otherwise unrelated. Um, and that, that gives quite a nice isolation of the SVSM component um, from the guest kernel. And of course, um, the whole thing is shielded from the hypervisor just because the um, guest is encrypted and uh, yeah, there's certain uh, integrity measures in place also. Um, one more important thing is that at startup, you basically can ask the AMD SAV SMP CPU to attest the initial memory image, which includes the um, SVSM. And that's signed by a chip unique key, which is called the VCEK, which I forgot what it stands for. I think it's something endorsement key. And that key, in turn, is um, signed by a by a certificate uh, by AMD. So, and this all together, so this, these isolation properties together with the uh, attestation at boot is, is, uh, makes it the ideal place for implementing a virtual TPM within the encrypted guest. Um, yeah. So, I was looking into just taking an existing software uh, TPM emulation implementation and kind of integrate that into the SVSM. So, and I did some research, which, which implementations are there. And for one, there's the, the official uh, TCG, T, Trusted Computing Group reference implementation um, that's at some point being donated by Microsoft and uh, yeah, the, the, the um, specification references it heavily and even has copies of the code within the PDFs itself. So um, then there's this uh, IBM SVTPM2 that's, uh, for, I, I believe from the GitHub uh, page, yeah, it's based, heavily based on the, on the original Microsoft uh, implementation. And then there's libTPMS, which is closely related to the former. I think it's just a, uh, making making the emulation available as, in, in, as a library. Um, all of these are share share a common uh, heritage and are written in in C. Um, the Coconut SVSM had been implemented in in Rust just because it's highly uh, 
security critical, and you know Rust uh, eliminates all <laughs> all bugs. So um, yeah, it's. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so in, in, in principle, but that wouldn't have stopped us from integrating some C libraries in, in, into the um, SVSM, like for example, the libtpms. Um, but the integration work would be rather involved because the TPM emulation, of course, depends on, for example, OpenSSL and stuff, and um, OpenSSL depends on a proper, like, Compiler environment like with glibc and and uh, proper malloc and everything and file uh, file system interface and all of that we don't have uh, in SVSM yet at least. So, but um, IBM actually did it. They uh, um, they uh, developed a proof of concept and uh, made a yeah submitted a, 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 a merge request on on GitHub against a, a, a different SVSM implementation. Um, so, yeah, it's doable, apparently. Um, so, but uh, I, I was just curious whether, whether we could, could get some implementation completely written in Rust, because, as I said, that would be highly secure thing, and just, just as a fun fact, so long, long, after, long after I started looking into this, um, the CVE had been published in the original Microsoft Reference implementation, which is basically um, yeah, an out-of-bound write, uh, and Rust would have prevented that. So because the, um, the vulnerability had been in the original Microsoft ref uh, Reference implementation, it basically trickled uh, down to all, all the other available implementation, and even to hardware chips, so, um, which seemed to be based on that as well. So, Let's do Rust. <laughs> um, so then that says that uh, you, if, if, if you had some contact with Rust, you probably know that crates.io page, which is basically a registry of um, Rust libraries. Um, and I was searching for, 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 for TPM, obviously, and uh, learned that almost everything related to supporting TPM, either client side, like, yeah, client side, or uh, yeah, there's, there is no emulation side, but the, even the client library side uh, is all only wrappers around um, the, the existing C libraries. Um, okay, so I, I will think about changing that a bit. And um, here's an overview of the of the how the the, TC, the TPM specifications organized. It's basically split in uh, four parts. Part one, if you want to read first, <laughs> obviously. Um, it describes the overall architecture and how everything is worked together in a very nice way. And part two and part three are basically just definitions of commands and their format on the wire. Um, part two and three all consist of tables in a certain format. You can see the, there's quite a number, like uh, 330 in total. Um, of, of definitions of these tables. Um, yeah, that's so part three is, is basically the commands, as I said, I believe, and part two is, is structure definitions, like type definitions referenced uh, by, by the commands part. Um, the tables are a follow a certain format, um, and these conventions have been put in place to facilitate automatic code generation. So that's, that's a quote from the specification. The, I think it's from the notation section and from the, from the second part. So, okay, so I, I was like, okay, let's go, let's take the tables and let's just generate some Rust code out of it. Um, the problem is that the tables are only available in line within the PDF, so there's no like machine processable ASCII-like format or anything. Um, searching the web, there, there had been two, um, yeah, two, two, two uh, versions of, of, of the tables extracted. One, one is the uh, TSS MSR GitHub project from Microsoft that's not been updated in quite a while. And researching a bit of the JIT history and everything, it seems like they had the uh, TPM specification in, in Microsoft Word format and just uh, made Word to extract the tables from there. 
Um, the other, the other uh, version I found was uh, part of the Android sources. There's a, also a TPM interface in them, and they apparently extracted the tables from the PDF uh, by means of some Adobe Acrobat editor table extraction functionality. The one, one thing to, to know is that PDF as a format is just a graphical vector language, so to speak, so the table structure is basically lost. It's just lines and uh, text, where, where, where to draw the text, basically. So, yeah. Um, okay, so I came to the conclusion that these rather old versions of, of the extracted tables is nothing I would really like to base my code generator on. And so, so I tried to extract them myself. Uh, PDF to text, the obvious uh, first solution did not work out because it just loses the, the, the table decoration on, or, or the formatting, the structure even. And then I Googled again and, and uh, searched for, for table recognition and stuff, and that turned out a lot of literature, lit, literature um, on table recognition algorithms with statistics and <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, quite involved, so I decided to not do that. Um, and I tried something really simple instead, so I just grouped all lines I could find on a page, like the vertical ones together and the horizontal ones together, and whenever there's an overlap, the uh, extraction algorithm would assume there's a table, right? So that's, and, and it works quite fine. So, um, yeah, so, and so basically we have that uh, um, TPM table extraction utility now, um, it works, I mean, I didn't check every single table, but the ones I did, um, it worked quite well, so um, that's a solved problem, I would say. You can find that uh, tool, which might be of value for itself, uh, on, on GitHub. So find the link there. Um, so then, making some actual code out of these tables, um, there's in, in so, so, uh, there's several t types of tables in the specification. One is the command tables, which just describes the command parameters and the order on which they are supposed on the wire and stuff. And similar for the response format, obviously. Um, and then that's part three. So part two has these structures, and there's kind of more types of, of tables, so the simplest one is just a list of name constants, you know that, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing to uh, talk about. Then a little bit more complicated is the type table, which is also an integer and can be either like enum-like, like, like cons named constants too, um, or it can be like integer values restricted to a certain range, like for example, there's a concept of of handles in, in a TPM, and for example, you can have a whole range of, of handles. Um, so for the, the, the more interesting uh, variant for today, the, the enumeration variant is, for example, um, to, only, to restrict allowed algorithm identifies to only the hash algorithms or, or stuff like that. So yeah, a bits type is just a bit field, bit field with flags. Uh, a structure is like a C-like structure. You have named fields and of, of, a, of a certain type, and then there's there's the union type. I, I show an example in a second. Uh, I think at least, yeah, there it is. So I inserted some white space to align the uh, CSV. So that's that's actually from a result from the from the extraction uh, program. Um, it's, it's a CSV-based format. So, and just, just a little bit of explanation because you don't have the context of all the other files. So the first parameter is the sensitive, sensitive type. is just an enum-like type of, of yeah, algorithm identifiers. Then uh, the last parameter, that's actually a, a, a union type. And what is also encoded in the table format is which uh, member of the structure would be serving as a discriminant for the union, right? Because you need to somehow know uh, which branch of the union is, is active. So, um, yeah, and then there's two, two more files in separating the two, but we ignore them for now. Uh, that's kind of quite similar to C, right? It translates 
it's directly to, to, to C definitions of structures or whatever. Uh, the problem is it does not translate easily or directly to Rust because it, Rust doesn't have any union. And for example, if you know C++, you have a similar problem there whenever you have like non-trivial destructors, um, a, a class cannot be a, a, a union member, really. Or it can, but with, <laughs> with, 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 with manual work involved. Um, so that's, that's only been half of the story. Rust does have unions, but uh, you would have to uh, basically, um, yeah, write every, every code making use of any, any, any unions in, into unsafe, and that's, uh, yeah, that's basically turns off the, the Rust uh, safety guarantees, and uh, people reviewing Rust code don't like that much. Um, so instead, Rust has uh, a, a, a different, a different uh, mechanism for, for supporting uh, um, the, tech, the, the tech, tech union pattern, which the tech union pattern, just as an explanation, is where you have some structure with a discriminant member and a union member, where the discriminant would select which branch of the union is active. Um, in, in Rust, you basically have uh, support for that because you can attach data to um, enumeration variants directly. So for example, here we have uh, uh, my labs con fuel and you see uh, four different uh, enumeration variants and each has a different kind of data or none at all attached to it. So and here's an example how we would instantiate such a thing. Um, yeah, so I know the problem. Um, one needs to solve in, in, in code generation is to uh, map these uh, structures from the uh, TPM specification, which are more leaning towards C, to these kinds of uh, these kind of, of Rust enums. Um, yeah, so that's that's a summary. So um, that's that's the same example with the with the, the non-relevant fields left out. Um, so the so the sensitive type, which is the union type, should be of, of a Rust enum type uh, with one variant per possible discriminant value, and then uh, yeah, it should be assigned to data which can be found for that particular discriminant value in that union. Uh, when we when we when we do that, we can drop the original discriminant because the information is already contained in the in the. Uh, enumeration carrying the actual data, right? So that should be dropped. Um, yeah, right, so then, so, um, so um, right now I'm um, using an enumeration for the sensitive member and um, the question is why don't we turn all of the structure into, into enumeration type? And yeah, the answer is that there's more than just the union and uh, the associated discriminant. But there are a lot of cases in the specification where, where there's really just a, um, a discriminant member and a union member, and then the uh, interface code generation that would just do that to, to uh, eliminate that extra uh, level. So that's, that's just been an example of one of the problems to solve uh, when, when transcribing the, the, the specification tables to the uh, Rust language. Um, so I, I um, listed some more uh, randomly which came to my mind. One is there's, there's uh, limits everywhere which are basically uh, a, a, a configuration dependent of the TPM or profile dependent, for example, um, maximum RSA key length or maximum uh, data buffer size and stuff like that. And um, yeah, the user should, the user of the, of the code should be able to somehow specify those in a, in a consistent way and uh, have them, yeah, have checked everywhere. So then there's some, then, then there's um, kind, kind Quite, quite, quite a number of, of uh, conditional features. Like, for example, every algorithm can be either enabled or disabled at compile time. Uh, for example, 
I don't know if, for example, if you're seeking a FIPS certification, you probably don't want any of the non-NIST curves enabled and stuff like that. And so you have to translate the, all these uh, features into, into the Rust uh, cargo feature system and track all the dependencies along the dependency graph. For example, if you completely disable uh, elliptic curves, just, just as an example, you don't need any of the structures, for example, uh, defining public, public key points, or, uh, yeah, public key points. Uh, then for uh, specific to the SVSM environment, it should be no SCD compatible, which is basically, no SCD basically means it's, it's embedded or you don't have the standard Rust library. Um, um, also, in, in an embedded system, you don't really want to have panics on like memory allocation failures, um, for example, which, which actually can happen in that environment because if some buff buffer needs to be copied or, or whatever, um, and the buffer is large, it could just fail. Um, then there's input buffer management, so um, depending on the environment, um, we need to consider the problem, which is a common source of vulnerabilities where you uh, check some buffer, some input, and the, uh, the, the, the user is still able to modify the buffer after the check has happened, so you somehow need to track which buffer is uh, subject to that uh, problem or not, and, and um, potentially just clone the buffer. Yeah, and then there's a feature of the, of the existing uh, table uh, um, uh, interface code generator. So in, by default, there's no unsafe code at all. But um, when constructing the um, nested data structure, Rust would move a lot of values along the stack, obviously, because, yeah. And for example, there's just one unsafe optimization where you can opt in to uh, construct the, the resulting structure in place, but that uh, requires some unsafe uh, annotation, and it's up to the user to decide whether he, he wants all that or not. Uh, it, yeah. So I, I would consider that the current state of the interface code generation as complete and usable, so try it out, <laughs> have fun. Um, the, the, the link is given, given there on the slide. So now, um, now some some uh, few, a few words on on the on the current work in progress, which is actually implementing a TPM after after the interface quest, uh, code question has has been solved. Um, for that, a, a, a short overview on the um, SVSM execution model. So it's basically. Uh, that the operating system would submit some synchronous command uh, or request to the SVSM, so then the uh, SVSM at the highest privilege, VMPL, the virtual machine privilege level, would get entered, the uh, SVSM or the TPM within would process that thing or the request and return back to the operating system. Um, a, a direct consequence of that is that the uh, why the CPU is executing in the, in the, within the SVSM, the operating system can't use it, or the, the guest kernel can't use it. Um, there's quite some potential that these, uh, the periods of time where, where, where the, where, where the um, SVSM is executing can be quite long. For example, there's TPMs have TPM state, like internal state, which needs to get, get written to a persistent location. And for, we're currently thinking of uh, having lots, like some flash-like, uh, yeah, flash-like file system, which the hypervisor would obviously need to write out somehow, um, and that can take arbitrarily long, I would say. And then there's the usual um, things like, like uh, with with every cryptographic uh, <laughs> implementation, so the, the, the math itself can take long, like RSI key generation or stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so the question is whether, how much of a problem that is that the, that the TPM could be blocking the CPU, the vCPU for arbit arbitrarily long. Um, just, so, just some background information I checked yesterday and the Linux kernel serializes TPM requests, so at least other vCPUs would not spin on some potential global log waiting for the TPM to become available again. Uh, 
And then there's a, a different uh, thing to consider, and that is that Rust code in, can, in principle, panic everywhere. Like, um, for example, for every um, yeah, buffer, buffer access, it gets bound checks, and if you're out of bounds, it would panic. Um, when that happens while you're holding a global spin lock, obviously the whole TPM would become inoperational for, for the rest of, of yeah, the boot. Um, and then there's um, considering that, 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 that there's this kind, kind of long I.O. Um, potentially, um, it might make sense to perhaps um, extend the existing SVSM protocol between the guest kernel and the SVSM by some asynchronous mechanism or so, but yeah, that's not clear yet. Um, and then um, it would also quite, be quite nice if, if the VTPM implementation could be split out and used uh, as a standalone library independent of the SVSM. And for example, Rust has this um, how's it called? Asynchronous uh, support. I mean, it's, it's, it's something similar is available, for example, in JavaScript, I believe, where, yeah, where you have that request pending, executing, and you just await for the closures to, to return. Um, yeah. So now I'm, because all of this point, I'm currently thinking about not having a global log protecting all the TPM state and serializing all requests, but um, I'm thinking more about having something like a transaction scheme where every, every pending request would in memory um, build up some transaction and at the end would try to commit that to the internal state and that would either succeed or not. Um, and so that would imply that you only would have to take logs for a very short uh, time, namely at, at, um, when trying to commit that transaction actually or apply it to the, to the internal state. So there's, there's an example, for example, there's the concept of um, HMAC sessions in a TPM where uh, each, each use of that uh, session would um, update a, a nonce, like a number used once. Um, and if two, two or more conflicting requests are using the same HMAC session and both would try to update the nonce, only one uh, request would succeed and the other would just fail. Um, so there's, uh, of course, advantages, advantages and disadvantages. So a global log is obviously <laughs> a lot more uh, easy to, to reason about. Um, so, and it's not clear whether, whether going with this asynchronous transaction approach is actually of much value because, I mean, the Linux kernel would serialize requests anyway. Um, but on the other hand, we could cancel requests at just without thinking any further, we could just leak basically the, the running request or kill it or panic. Uh, so, yeah, kill it or <laughs> have it panic at, at random points. Um, yeah, and, and, and it would support the, the async await uh, pattern right away. So, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's, that's a work in progress, and I'm still looking and trying to come up with something some reasonable architecture there. So, thank you. Are there any questions? Ah, yeah, take the mic, please. Hello. Hi. Uh, <laughs> In the beginning, you said uh, about Microsoft donating the code. Yeah. I would, I would like to understand what donating means. That's, that's, uh, a, that's a quote. I read it somewhere, I think, in the... Um, I think... So there's been these uh, three different implementations, right? And I think uh, in, and at the GitHub readme of the second one, the IBM project, which is based on the first, they said that Microsoft donated the... Yeah. Uh, implementation to the TCG, so TCG. So that's not my. <laughs> really. yeah, yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I'm the the, the the GitHub repo open, and uh, it's a BSD license. So I I think the the derivative work is fine. But uh, I was wondering about how is it being used as a as the the 
de facto standard for other implementations. And if you were going to follow that, or you will you follow on from, we will just use that as a base to bootstrap your Rust implementation. Oh no! I'm, uh, so it's it's not it's not like a de facto standard. It is really um, a, a standard. So the the um, specification references the the, the reference implementation. Yeah, I, I actually so. meant as a, the, the standard implementation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So of of course, uh, when when something's unclear or in in the in the in the like the PDF specification, then I I'll look at the reference code. So yeah. Pretty so easy. that's the definitive uh, implementation. Yeah. He brought the mic to me, it's so useful. Um, with your uh, unsafe building of the structure versus the safe version, yeah. did you actually look in something like Godbolt to see the decompiled version of the optimized code to actually check if that's... Uh, okay, good question. The, so yeah, basi basically the question is whether the optimization make any sense, right? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, and so I um, looked at the assembly myself yeah. Not, obviously not in all the 330 table cases, but uh, like randomly. And uh, so there's, there's really a lot of stack moves if you don't use the unsafe uh, version. Was that, was that with an optimized? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's a release build. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you consider using something like const as well? Because const is compile time evaluated in Rust. Not yeah, but right. But when the input comes from yeah, the okay. wire, you can't. So I mean const. Yeah. Won't help you because it's not const. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah. So and uh, just one more one more uh, remark about these unsafe optimizations. So I haven't tried them actually yet. So like in, in a real because I don't have a VTPM uh, implementation ready. So but there's several uh, experimental optimization you can switch on and have a look. So perhaps I'll ditch them at some point. So it's just uh, yeah. I have one here. Yeah. Um. You have neatly laid out now the interfacing and the standards compliance, but uh, have you looked at the cryptographic primitives yet? Is there some Rust standard library? Yeah, project? there is. There's the uh, Rust crypto uh, project, I believe, which consists of, of a lot of libraries, uh, uh, an individual library for like every single hash function um, or elliptic curves or whatever. And I wrote me some wrappers I could use just to make sure that the risk. Rust crypto library would provide everything I need um, because so there's also some some more background so the the Microsoft reference implementation uses S open SSL which kind of is problematic to port into embedded uh, environments and as an alternative one could use wolf SSL I believe it's called um, and if I remember correctly the IBM proof of concept actually did that so they uh, exchange uh, open SSL for wolf SSL but I'm not sure about the license compatibility. So, um, yeah. I mean, we have a certain license, I don't remember exactly, for the SVSM, and I'm not sure how compatible that will be. But, of course, you can also, for, for, the, for the Rust TPM impl implementation, you could just uh, write wrappers, not around Rust crypto, but around uh, Wolf SSL if you wanted to. So, uh, so but... <laughs> There's actually there's not much cryptographic primitives needed uh, for the TPM. It's only basically hashes, uh, symmetric ciphers, ciphers uh, elliptic curves, and RSA. So that's uh, yeah. Thank you. Some more questions. Okay, oh, we're over time anyway. So sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you.